Good afternoon. Thanks. Thanks for coming right after lunch. Probably not as painful as the people who came to my morning session, which was at 8 a.m. Okay, so, so, so that's really difficult. I have only the most modest expectations of this, of, of this presentation. What I'm hoping to find here, what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm hoping is in this room is the next Karen Pryor or Jean Donaldson. So very, very modest aspirations. <laughs> okay, so title of the presentation is we may not be the rocket scientists, but we can be the engineers. The next, what I hope, is the next scientific revolution in, in dog training. Let me find the page down. Yes, there we go. That's just me. Um, and the, the, reason for, the reason for that title really comes out of some of my experience with my brother, who is, for all intents and purposes, a rocket scientist of sorts. He's, a, he's, he's an aerospace engineer, you know, does, does big... He did lots of shuttle stuff and stuff, you know, big mucky muck in that. And he was constantly telling me stories of the, of, of the difference between what the physicists would tell them would work, you know, in terms of, in terms of aerospace and what the engineers actually had to design to do to make something practical. And so, so what I'm hoping may, might come out of this is planting some seeds in people's minds that are going to help you start to think about, okay, there's this huge just flowering of research in, in, in canine behavioral science. How can we use this? And newsflash, guys, the scientists aren't going to tell you. They have no idea. But so, okay, so you've got the force-free movement, you've got using operant and classical conditioning in, in systematic ways, you've got applying the techniques of applied behavior analysis, which were first used with, say, you know, developmentally delayed humans, applying those to dogs, and saying, eh, this, these particularly ethological ideas, they just don't work for us. Okay, but, but. There are limitations, particularly in pet dog training. I would say there are fewer limitations in working dog training in things that are, or, or even competitive dog training, okay, because, because the person at the other end of the leash is different from, from the usual pet owner. But I don't know about your practice, but, but in my practice, I found you know, quite often at a, at, a fairly, at a fairly high rate, pet owners who didn't want to become technicians. And this stuff is techie, okay? They just wanted things to work better with their dogs. Okay? And it's, it's not, it, you, you, you certainly expend a lot of energy trying to make these things more, more intuitive, but it's difficult with, the, with, 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 your, with your average person. Yeah, so it turns out that, that dogs share, you know, many cognitive abilities with people. Now, obviously, there are limitations to that. You know, dogs don't write books. Okay, I don't know any dogs that, that, that operate computers in the, in, in the way that I do, although I know some that can do things where they, where they push buttons and things and make things happen. You know, they can do secondary things like that. So, so that's the challenge that I, that I want to put to you. I think, I, think, I think this is the audience who can answer this question, is can we take the way that, that we communicate with our clients, the ways, the intuitive ways that they communicate with their dogs and enhance enhance them, give them informed ways to, to enhance that and make it more scientifically congruent to make their relationships better. And I just know there's stuff there with dogs. Okay. Um, dogs can also cooperate. So they can, they can succeed on tasks where the only way to get the food is to cooperate with somebody else. And, and they can cooperate with other dogs and they can do the same tests and cooperate with people. Okay, so, so one of the classics on this is one where you've got, where you've got two ends of a, of a string, you know, with something to hang on to, and the, and the, other, the, the other end of the string is, is kind of around a, around a surface that's behind a barrier that's got food in it, and if you just pull one end of the string, it, you know, the string just comes out. So, so you've got to have two individuals pulling on the string at the same time in order for anybody to get the food. Dogs can do this. 
Lee. These are two slides. You can look at these slides, these two slides, and they're self-explanatory. I include them in, in, every pre in every talk I ever do now, because this is really about that dichotomy between, between the family dog and the resident dog. I, I have believed for a very long time, and now the science supports me, that the single most powerful thing that you can do if you're working with a client who doesn't interact with their dog very much, if, whether, it's, whether it's crated in the basement all the time or living out in a kennel, is just get the freaking dog in the house. If you can find a way to get the dog in the house, a whole lot of stuff is going to get a whole lot better without, without much more technical intervention on that, because the dogs will then have an opportunity to figure out, to sort out those relationships. Hugely, hugely powerful. Okay. I'm, I'm, only, I'm only a couple of minutes over. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>